Chapter 9, Airway Management. Airway is one of those very important things for all patients. If they don't have a good airway, we don't have a quality patient. So uh, some very important stuff here, and we're going to go over all the good details. Let's talk about the uh, basic physiology. Airway physiology, we uh, kind of remember that uh, the airway is divided in the upper and lower. We've got the upper airway, nose and mouth, down to the epiglottis. Uh, we have the oral pharynx and the nasal pharynx, and the laryngeal pharynx is the lower portion that's sitting right on uh, the back of the mouth into the right to the top of the trachea. So the larynx is that dividing line between the two. It sits on the top of the trachea. That's where your vocal cords are. Here's a representation of what it looks like. So you got the nasal pharynx with all the tubulances in there. Uh, then you've got the mouth, and you notice the big uh, uh, muscle in the back of the mouth called the tongue. That's what uh, helps us control the airway, make, uh, make it uh, stay open for us. But it can also be the part that causes a blockage for us. If the patient's unresponsive and the tongue relaxes, it falls to the back of the throat. Simple solution is move the tongue. Uh, either moving the head, lifting the jaw, lots of options there. But you can see uh, we've got the epiglottis, the little flap that comes down over the trachea. Right in here, that's what keeps the air, or it keeps the food going into the esophagus that goes on the back side here, and the trachea sits more anterior. The lower airway starts at the trachea goes down to the main bronchi, right and left, gets smaller, and then the alveoli at the very end. The pulmonary capillaries surround each alveoli, that's where the gas exchange happens. So we've seen uh, some representations of that in the previous chapter. There's the visual of what's going on there. So you've got the uh, trachea down the center, the right main bronch uh, bronchus, and then breaks down to the smaller uh, bronchioli, and then eventually into the uh, alveoli. Picture the alveoli coming off. These are the little bitty sacs that uh, fill up with air, completely surrounded by capillaries, and we have the gas exchange. Certain disease processes uh, damage these over the life, uh, the emphysemas, the chronic bronchitis. We can also have acute damage from any type of exposure to uh, chemicals, smoke, or uh, other gases other than uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Pediatric airway, things we have to remember, and this will help us ad adjust how we're treating the airways of the pediatrics. Their airways are uh, shorter and narrower. Remember, they don't have much of a neck, so the airway is a little bit shorter there, and it sits a little bit more anterior. So you can't just tilt the head back. You have to do a little bit more adjustment on it. Mouth and nose are small, so we can get obstructions. Just a little bit of uh, mucus in the nose will give you a, com a complete airway blockage for a kiddo. The tongue is typically about the size of the adult tongue, so it's easier to block the, uh, the back of the throat there. Like uh, we said, the nose uh, newborns and infants are nose breathers. Trachea is softer, so if you tilt the head back too far on an infant, you can actually kink it like you'd kink a straw. So it's very uh, important that you uh, kind of protect the airway there. Chest wall is a lot softer, so you can act, you can have damage to the interior without any uh, fractured ribs. So it's something we need to be aware of, looking for mechanism of injury, and look address the potential. Here's a representation of what the what's going on with the airway for the kiddos. You see because the back of the head here is bigger it sets the chin up higher and this airway is not straight on the adult you lay flat on a supine position your airway is fairly straight so what you want to do is add something underneath these shoulders and bring them up even with the back of the throat so just take a folded towel or something to put in there so the path of his of the airway. Obstructions from foreign bodies, food, small toys, pieces of chicken or turkey. We all know those things can happen. Uh, we also have liquids, uh, mainly vomit, blood. Interesting uh, side note, the uh, there was 
back in the 80s, early 90s, there was a uh, Chechen rebel group that took over theater in uh, Russia. The Russian military doesn't play around with uh, terrorists, so they gassed everybody in the th- in the theater with uh, fentanyl gas. Allegedly, they never admitted to it, but fentanyl is an anesthetic. It made everybody pass out, and then they went out, went in, and rescued the hostages and eliminated the terrorists. Um, but when they t- took the hostages out, they set them upright in buses, waiting for them to come to from the uh, anesthesia. One of the side effects of anesthesia is typically vomiting. Several people died waiting in those buses because they vomited and it blocked their airways. So it's something you have to remember. If the person has an altered mental status, you've got to be very careful about those airway obstructions and watch and uh, make sure you don't create any more than is already there. Some uh, obstructions are acute and some are chronic. Uh, People that have some type of disease process that uh, produces more saliva or more um, more mucus, they can have a chronic obstruction. If you listen to somebody that's a chronic smoker, the first uh, few breaths in the morning, they've got enough mucus built up in their lungs and their airway that they end up coughing and uh, hacking for a while. Anytime we have a patient, airway's number one. So we need to make sure that's covered. Sometimes they're, they're, you assign one person just to monitor the airway. It's a great job for a paramedic student. To, here, you watch this airway. If they quit breathing or the airway become compromised, fix it or say something. We could also have air obstructions from swelling interior. Something from the anaphylactic reaction might cause a, a swelling of the throat and block the airway. Burns. This superheated air goes in and burns the airway, causes swelling. The way you tell if a person has been exposed to hot air or uh, something that could burn the airway is looking for soot around the nose and mouth. Gives you a pretty good indication they sucked in some pretty hot air. Then we also have uh, people that have asthma- asthmatic attacks. That smooth muscles, constriction of the lower airways, causing problems. You can't get air in if the muscles are, or the uh, airways are constricted. Four sounds we're going to run into. Strider, a high-pitched whistling sound. Uh, narrow passageways, you heard somebody who got something stuck in their throat and they kind of squeak. Hoarseness, or that raspy thing. Uh, if you ever watch Chicago PD, uh, Hank Voigt, the sergeant on that show, has a raspy voice. That's some type of damage, long-term damage to the vocal cords. It could be acute. Uh, if someone has raspy voice right after a uh, fire or some type of chemical exposure, you know, they probably got some damage in there. You have the snoring. Uh, they are unresponsive, and you hear the snoring sound coming out of their mouth. Open their airway. Do a head tilt chin lift. It fixes the problem. Gurgling would be a liquid obstruction, something you hear bubbles going through or air going through the liquid and causing bubbles. Uh, That's the gurgling sensation. Just suction the airway, clean it out. Every patient, you need to ask these two questions. Is the airway open? It can be as simple as they're talking to you. If they're talking to you, you know the airway is open. And the other question is, can they maintain the airway? If they can't, that's your job. We look, we're going to look at several devices we can install in the patient to maintain that airway. But even if you do an adjunct, you still need to watch it to make sure it maintains the airway. Uh, a patient without an airway is not a patient for you anymore. It becomes a problem for the coroner. So maintain the airway the whole time you've got contact with your patient. Some sounds you might hear in the nose and mouth. Um... You might hear gurgling, that's the liquid in the back, gasping. They're trying to get extra air in, try to pull it in past some type of obstruction. Crowing, they make a high-pitched uh, squeal as they make an effort to breathe air in or push air out. Wheezing is mostly, more, uh, mainly the lower airway, so that's the obstruction of the lower airways. You hear the squeeze, kind of a, a squeaky noise inside the chest. And then snoring would be the... Uh, tongue blocking the back of the airway. Some some people it's as simple as making sure they're sitting up a little bit semi-fowlers or fowlers. Some people you can roll them on their side, put them in recovery position and maintain the airway. 
whatever you have to do, maintain that airway. If something changes, you stop and re reassess the airway and make sure it's stayed open. The patient is conscious and then they quit talking to you, check the airway. If their uh, airway is blocked and you get it cleaned out, check the airway again to make sure it's really open. So always going back and checking the airway. Constant consideration. If you don't uh, maintain it, your patient becomes critical. The airway is partially obstructed. That's when you've got to make a few decisions. How obstructed is it? Do you need to try to force it to open up even more, or can you maintain what you've got? So sometimes it's as simple as just uh, maintaining the system as, as is, and then you have to uh, get them to the hospital as quick as possible. Watch for mental status changes. Always be talking to your patient if they're conscious, and watch how their mental status changes, asking them questions, seeing what, if they change their answers, if they change their ability to uh, converse with you, or their speech patterns change. All things that say the airway might not be open. Signs of the inadequate airway. No breathing. Duh. If they're not breathing, they need to have you breathe for them. It may be the airway is obstructed, and as soon as you open it, they start breathing, but something is blocking it. Evidence of a foreign body airway, or foreign bodies in the airway. Uh, no air felt or heard in the nose or mouth. You put your, that's something we learned in CPR class. Look, listen, and feel. Put your head down next to their head. Look for the breathing in the chest, listen for the air coming in and out of the mouth, and then feel the air coming out on your cheek to see if they're actually breathing. They can't speak or they have difficulty speaking. They got that two or three word dyspnea where they can't uh, say more than a couple words at one time. That's a sign of inadequate airway. They can't keep it open. Unusual hoarseness or raspy voice. Something tells you this, there's, there's something wrong with the way they're talking to you. Or the absence or no chest movement. If the chest isn't going up and down, assume there's an inadequate airway and you got to fix it until you prove otherwise. Signs that uh, they're working a little bit harder, the belly is pushing air in and out. Typically when we breathe, you don't see the belly move up and down. But if they're using the belly to push air, that says there's a problem with the airway and they're having to use extra force to push the air through. You don't hear lung sounds. You listen to the chest with your stethoscope, you don't hear anything. Or you hear strange noises, the wheezing, the crowing, the strider, gurgling, gasping. Kiddos, they'll use a lot of extra muscles to try to force the air in and out. And when they do that, the nose flaps back and forth. It's like a, a boxer that's trying to breathe through his nose really hard. The nose kind of moves back and forth when they breathe. It's something to look at when you're dealing with the kiddos. So opening the airway, number one priority for all patients. Simple as making them talk to you, make a kid cry, or doing some manual maneuvers or some more advanced maneuvers here. So if you have a problem, fix it. Airway is not one you wait. Uh, you open the airway, and if you have to open it, you're going to have to maintain it. It's not like the patient forgets to open their airway. Uh, once you remind them they start doing it, you need to keep doing it. They're not going to uh, keep that way. So mental status changes. Put the patient on the back, and then open the airway. If they have any suspect, suspicion of spinal trouble, head or neck injuries, you got to protect the head. But if you can't open the airway without moving the head or neck some, you've got to move the oh, open the airway. A patient with an intact cervical spine but not breathing is not a patient, uh, for you at least. So prefer to hold the head and neck as you open the airway. If you can't, then you choose the airway over spinal protection. If you have the mechanism, anything like that, try to hold the head in place, have your partner hold it while you open the airway, or the, the family says something happened to them that could be a head injury. So listen to your patient, get the mechanism of injury, find out what happened and uh, treat them as needed. If the patient's conscious, take care of the airway. Unconscious, place them in the head, uh, the supine position with the head lifted. Uh, take the nose and point it up to the sky. That's a head tilt chin lift method. If the patient is laying on a pillow and having trouble breathing, 
simple solution. Take the pillow out from beneath your head. That puts the, the trachea back in line with the body, and it opens the airway. It's, it's sometimes a simple solution that we can fix a really complicated process here. So if, they, uh, if you need to adjust the head any, maybe put a pad behind the head, behind the shoulders, depends on your patient. If the patient's a pediatric, you put it behind the shoulders. If it's an adult, you might put it behind the head. If they're wearing a helmet that you can't take off or you think it might cause more harm, you put it behind the adult shoulders. If they're wearing some type of padding, like a night at a uh, Renaissance festival, you might want to put the padding behind the head so you can keep them in a normal position. So you're going to have to make some judgment calls here on how to keep the head and neck all aligned so you can keep the airway open, but that's your job, and we're going to show you different tricks on how to do that. So you want the ear at the same level of the suprasternal notch. The suprasternal is the notch right at the top of the sternum, right underneath the trachea. So you want the ears kind of level with that. Manual ways to open the head, or open the head, open the airway. Head tilt, chin lift. You take the head, turn it backwards, put the chin straight up, and it pulls the tongue off the back of the throat. This is one that we use for unresponsive patients who have no suspicion of spinal injury. If they do have any spinal injury uh, potential, we use what's called the jaw thrust. And we're we'll talking about both of them here. So for the head tilt chin lift, you place one hand on the forehead one hand underneath the chin and you tilt the head backwards pushing the forehead down and pulling the chin up as you pull the chin forward it pulls the jaw forward and it pulls the tongue off the back of the throat important when you do this don't shove the mouth closed that kind of defeats the purpose if you're pulling the tongue off the back of the throat so they breathe and you close the mouth you aren't opening the airway. You need to make sure the mouth stays open. Here's a kind of example of what's going on. Head tilt, head tilting the head with the right hand, pulling the chin up with the left hand, getting the patient in a position there. If we have suspicion of spinal injury, we're doing the jaw thrust. You keep the head, neck, and spine all in one one unit. You have somebody sit there and hold it. If you're by yourself, you can sit on your knees and use a knee, a leg on either side of the head to hold the head in position. Kind of lock it in, and then you reach down and put your thumbs on their cheekbones, fingers behind the jaw, and then squeeze your fingers together, and it'll bring the jaw forward and off the back of the throat. So that's one way to get that uh, that jaw thrust in place. Use the fingers at the angles of the back, and then once you do this, you have to maintain it. If you let go, it goes back into the uh, unwanted position. Here's what it kind of looks like. He could be clamping the head down a little bit more with his knees, and you put your thumbs there on the cheeks and fingers behind the jawbone, and you squeeze together. So obstructed airways we're going to deal with. If you can't get it open... If you open it and they don't breathe, or you can't get air to go in with a back valve mask, then you assume it's a foreign body obstruction. You're going to have to get it open. If a person is choking and coughing, encourage them to cough. If they're not choking, uh, not coughing, assume the airway is blocked and do abdominal thrust if they're conscious. If they're unconscious, we go to the chest compressions, just like we do for CPR. So if they're conscious, kneel behind them, stand behind them, place a fist over the navel, grasp your fist and pull it in and up, just like you see in Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh, just start yanking on them until the thing comes out. If you've ever done it, it takes a lot of force. And if you ever had it done to you, it's okay if they do extra force because you know what the end result's going to be when they get it out for you. If your patient is less than one, and they're conscious, they're, they're actually moving around, we use the infant choking process, which is a little bit different than adults and uh, pediatrics. But the infant, you lay them on your forearm, supporting the head with your hand, and you do five forceful back slaps 
and try to bounce it out. So what you're doing is you're leaning them forward, lean them down, so you use a little gravity. You're hitting them in the back, trying to force that air to go out. Once you do that, you flip them over so that they're laying on their back on your arm with your head supported in your hand. And then you push on the chest five times. And you keep doing that back and forth until they cough it out or they become unresponsive. We do not just jam our fingers in into anybody's mouth because we don't want to push the object back in. So it's very important to, to just do the back slaps, chest thrusts, and alternate that. If they're adults, you do abdominal thrusts until it comes out or they become unresponsive. If, you, if they're too big, maybe they're pregnant, they're uh, really obese, you can't get your arms around them, you put your hands around their chest and squeeze the chest. If you can't do that, you knock them to the ground and you lay them down and you do the abdominal thrust from being straddling them. If they become unconscious, drop them to the ground. Maybe the fall will help uh, dislodge it. And then start CPR. All right, some airway adjuncts. Once we get it open, we've done a, manually, a manual process. Now we've got some options to hold it open. So we uh, have our airway adjuncts. We have the OPAs, the oral pharyngeal airways, and the nasal pharyngeal airways. Both of these help keep the tongue off the back of the throat to maintain that open airway. OPA is only used on unresponsive patients with no gag reflex. If you put it in a patient with a gag reflex, they vomit and that doesn't do well for your airway. So we need to make sure that they don't have a gag reflex. If you put it in, be very careful and watch them. If they gag, you pull it right back out. If they do have a gag reflex from an oral airway, there's a possibility that an NPA would work. So keep that in the back of your mind. If one doesn't work, the other one may be a possibility for us. You have to open the airway with a head tilt chin lift or some type of jaw thrust before you can do the airway adjunct. But once you get it in, it holds the tongue off the back. You still need to maintain the position, the airway, but it's a adjunct to make it work even better. One thing, uh, because we're going to potentially stimulate the gag reflex, we want to have our suction devices ready, just in case. If the patient starts to gag when you start put, to put the OPA or NPA in, you stop immediately, remove it, and apply suction to clear the airway out again. So be, be always be aware of that as you're putting these in. You can also suction with the airway in if they start to develop fluids in the back. If they get conscious, take, an air, take the airway out. Most conscious patients do not like to have an airway jammed in there. Uh, the other thing we've got to be aware of is maintaining really strict uh, infection disease control processes, especially with COVID being an airborne disease. We're really cautious about uh, putting airways in patients now, so follow your local protocols. That can be uh, as simple as a face mask with the face shield to try to give you that extra protection, or in the hospital they use uh, air, uh, positive airway pressure uh, PPE, things to keep the air out uh, the whole time you're doing this. So use your local protocols, and the, the, they're designed to help protect you. The OPA, it's the plastic curved device that goes over the top of the tongue, sits on the back of the tongue, and then rests at the lips. If it's sticking out too far, put a smaller size in. If it's in, it's not going deep enough to pull the tongue off, get the bigger size. So they go from 0 to 6 on sizes. Uh, you don't need to memorize the sizes because we're going to measure on every single patient. So you're going to pick the size that works the best for your patient. There's a picture of the different sizes. There's different types on the market. Uh, this is just one of the many brands out there. They all have special features that one manufacturer thinks are better than the others. But as long as they go in the mouth and they protect the airway, they're good to go. So to determine the size of the airway, you, uh, with the oral pharyngeal airways, we're measuring depth. So we're looking from the corner of the mouth to the tip of the earlobe on the side, on the same side. So you put it up next to the face, 
you measure from the corner of the mouth to the tip of the ear. Now, if they've got gauges in and their ears are kind of floppy, go where the factory original settings for the earlobe was. But you can also use the uh, center of the mouth to the angle of the jawbone. <clears throat> Once you do this a few times, you'll get good at kind of kind of measuring these real quick and putting them in. If it's too big, take it out. If it's too small, take it out, put the right size in. Usually you have plenty of options there. Here's how you measure it. So going from the corner of the mouth to the earlobe. It's going to sit that deep into the, the structure. The, the back of the oral pharynx is about the, even with the earlobe. So that gives us a good clue on what we're doing here. There's the, the other way you're putting in and uh, going from the center of the mouth to the corner of the jaw. That gives you about the same approximation. For inserting the OPA, patient needs to be supine, and you have to have the airway open manually. Use a cross finger technique. You put the thumb on the upper jaw and the forefinger on the lower jaw, and you kind of make a cross with your fingers, and it opens the airway for you. I'm not picky about how you open the airway. Just open it up. You take the airway and put it where it's facing the top of the head so the curve is facing uh, the open part of the curve is facing up so what we're doing is we're sliding it around along the top palate and once you get to the back of the tongue you're rotating it 180 degrees so it slides down over the back of the tongue so it's it's a, a simple process slide in twist at 180 you can do a 90 degree if you're you're feeling uh, adventurous, but either way, you're going in with it not sticking down over the top of the tongue or it will actually push the tongue backwards. So you need to go in over the top of the tongue and then switch it and pull it forward. Here's that cross finger technique, open in the mouth. This is where you'll find out if the patient's really unresponsive because once you start doing this, they'll start biting at you. So keep an eye on them and pull your fingers back if you have to. This shows the, it going in upside down. Yeah, so you got the curve going towards the top of the head right there and then going into the mouth. Rotate it 180 degrees, position it in the patient, make sure the flange is next to the tips of the lips and monitor the patient. That's where that you get that one person, that's their job is to monitor the patient. You can use an NPA or nasal pharyngeal airway if the if the patient has a gag reflex, the teeth are clenched. Some type of seizure activities cause them causes them to uh, clench the teeth, or uh, some type of brain injury, or there might be enough oral injuries. Maybe there's some damage to the tongue, and you want to just avoid putting things in the mouth right now. So you take the OPA and uh, you slide it in. If the patient has any type of skull fracture, interior skull fracture. You see uh, signs of uh, bleeding out the ears or cerebral spinal fluid coming out the ears or nose. There's That's a contraindication for uh, sticking a tube in the nose. We really don't want to stick it in if there's any type of fracture that we're going to push through into the brain. You might scramble the brain and make them a paramedic. Um, the epistaxis, they're bleeding already too much, so we don't want to add to that or any other nasal trauma. So put steps for inserting the ONPA. You measure it from the nostril to the tip of the earlobe or the angle of the jaw. Same, similar process, the point of entry. So the nose is where we're putting these in. The mouth is where we put the OPA in. So we measure from the, the point of entry to the tip of the earlobe or the angle of the jaw. Here's where I told you I, I do it differently. This says you lubricate the, the tube on the outside. I lubricate the nostril that I'm going to send it into. That way I've got a clean tube as I'm trying to push it in. I'm not slipping on my tube. Either way works. Use your best judgment, but keep uh, try both. Uh, and then push the tip up towards the nose. Keep the head in a neutral position. You don't want to have the head tilted back on this one. You want to keep it fairly neutral. And the other thing is you saw that there was a bevel on the front of the nostril. 
you want that to be towards the septum. So when you put it in, you want that bevel, the outs, the, the longer part of the tube to be on the outside going in. So it's uh, the bevel is facing towards the middle. If you have to put it in the left nares, you turn it and you face it towards the center again. It's going to look like it's curved differently, but it's a, it's a rubber tube. It'll bend for you, and it won't have any difficulties at all. There's measure in the nostril, uh, measuring from the no, uh, nose to the earlobe. Here's where they're lubing them up. If you just do the tip like that, that's probably okay. But if you get it all a little bit higher, you're going to have trouble sliding it in. So that's why I just stick it in the nose. Here's kind of putting it in the nose. Notice how our head's not tilted back very far. It's just kind of slide. It's uh, neutral, and he's sliding it in. And then just push it in until it's uh, back against the nose. So you can do two of these, one on each nostril and an OPA if you think that's necessary. It's not, uh, it's not overboard to over protect your airways. We also, as EMTs, have access to superglottic airways. Uh, the glottic opening is the uh, epiglottic, epiglottis, so it's the top of the larynx. If you try an OPA and it doesn't work, or you've got an OPA in and you want to make it better, a superglottic is the way to go. Every, we have four different ones that we hear, uh, have a, a models of in our, our program. We have the uh, eye gel. That's our primary one that we like in our, our systems here in Colorado Springs. We also have the LMA, lar lar laryngeal mask airway. We have the combi tube, which is a little bit older. It's probably 25 years old, but it's still a viable possibility. And then we also have the King Airway. Depends on what your medical director prefers. That's the one you're going to have. So we'll practice with all of them. General steps is get the patient in the right position. Make sure they've got plenty of uh, oxygen in, in their system. Maybe give them a couple of extra breaths. Have a plan. Who's going to do the insertion? Who's going to head the head? Who's going to maintain the airway? Who's going to suction and make sure all the equipment's there before you start? Airway management is vital to your patient's survival, so we have to have a plan on what we're doing. Pick the right size device. As uh, With the King, the LMA, and the iGel, they're based on the weight of your patient. So you need to have uh, a ba a, an idea of how much your patient weighs in kilograms. The combi tube is based just purely on the patient is over 16 years old and they are over 5 feet tall. So if they're below 5 feet, you can't use it on them. And if they are under 16, you can't use a uh, combi tube. So the, just know what your requirements are for your manufacturers. They all, almost all of them have some type of inflation process, except for the eye gel. So make sure those are prepared correctly, and we'll practice with those. And always have your suction around. All right, suctioning, vital to maintaining the airway. If you have some type of foreign body airway uh, blocking your airway, suction is probably not going to help you. Suction will mainly work on fluids. The opening on all our suction devices is about four millimeters. So if you got any type of chunkies or any foreign bodies, it will not pick those up. It's only for blood, uh, vomitus, any type of fluids. So we're going to use that to clean it out. We can also use gravity. That's a great tool. Turn the patient to their side. Let it fall out. Lean them forward if they're conscious and let them vomit into a trash bag. So there's all kinds of ways to protect the airway. Suctioning is one of those many ways. Suction devices, uh, we have manual, we have get battery powered. There are oxygen powered suction devices and then the ones in the ambulance are uh, powered by a compressor. So know what systems you have, 
how each one of them works, and then the important thing, test it before you start your shift. Test it throughout the shifts to make sure everything's good. Each suction unit's going to have the, suction, uh, the source of the vacuum, what sucks for you. Some type of collection container. Hospitals are really kind of strange. They like to see the content of whatever you suction just so they can get an idea of what's going on with your patient. There is some type of tubing that connects the, su the suction device to the suction tool, the uh, suction tip or catheter. So you got to have that tubing and then the different types of catheters we have. Vehicle mount. They have a vacuum in there. They uh, at least 30 mil or 30 liters per minute. So they got pretty good suction. The portable units are oxygen or air powered. Not my preference because I'm using oxygen for not giving to a patient and I prefer to keep my oxygen for my patients. Most of them are electrically powered, some type of battery system. And then the one that I carry in my personal first aid kit is a manual one. It's all hand powered, so you squeeze it and it sucks. Here's the wall mounted in the ambulance. This is what you also see in the hospital, wall mounted into their suction and their vacuum unit within the system. <coughs> you have to have the tubing, the suction tips, the catheters, collection, and then the last thing that we didn't mention was the container of clear sterile water. Well, after you're done suctioning, you dip it in this water and it sucks up a little water and cleans out your tube so you don't get things clogging up your tube as soon as you need to use it the second time. Helps you so you don't have to clean the tube out every time. So two different types of suction tips we're going to run into. A yonker or a tonsil tip, it's a rigid suction device. It's really good for maintaining the airway. Uh, you can get it in. Unresponsive patients slip it into the back of the throat. But we want to be careful and not stick it in far enough we cause gag reflex. It'd be kind of bad if we're trying to clear an airway and we stimulate the vomiting reflex to block the airway. Kind of defeats your purpose there. So using the same measuring technique you did for your OPAs, measure your catheter from the corner of the mouth to the earlobe and put your fingers at that point and that's how deep you can go with it. That way you don't hit the back of the throat and cause the uh, patient to vomit. We also have the soft suction catheters, uh, also known as French, French tipped. They can slide around the teeth, they can go around clenched teeth, they can go into some of our airways and suction out the airway. So there's some options for you. Use what is appropriate for your patient. In class, we will practice with both types and let you have some uh, some experience trying to figure out which one's the most appropriate. The collection container should be non-breakable. That should be an obvious for you. You do not want to drop a container full of vomit and have it break all over your feet. Uh, and then we said the container of water to keep it clear. Pediatric suctioning. Be really careful when you go too deep in a pediatric. You can actually hit the vagus nerve in the back of the pharynx. Stimulating the vagus nerve stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system and causes a drop in the heart rate, drop in blood pressure, and that's not good for your kids. If they're already having difficulties enough that you're having to suction their airway, and now you just put them in a lower me metabolic rate by changing their heart rate and their respiratory rate, that is not good. So uh, try to avoid that. Always use infection control. Use your uh, gloves, your eye protection, maybe a mask, uh, especially with any patient that may have COVID or any, any other airborne, you're gonna use extra precaution. When possible, limit suctioning in no more than 10 seconds at a time. This is because if the patient is breathing and we start suctioning, they're not breathing while we're suctioning. So 10 seconds at a time is our max. If they are not breathing and we're trying to open an airway, you want to suction until the airway is open. So use some of your, your training and your um, experience here. If they, If you're trying to open the airway, do not stop until the airway is open. If you're trying to maintain the airway while they're breathing, 10 seconds is your max. 
The other thing we're going to do is put the suction tube into the mouth no deeper than we measured and then apply suction. We don't suck on the way in, we only suck on the way out. If we can place the patient on their side, we do that to have gravity start helping us out and kind of pushing things out. If the patient is vomiting anything besides the liquid, there's any chunkies in there, you're going to have to use your fingers or gravity to try to get it out too. Here's trying to get the, everything set up. You notice they've got their PPE on. They've actually got a uh, face mask with the extensions over the eyes, which is a good thing. They are wearing latex gloves, which is odd, but uh, she's getting her uh, tubing ready, testing everything out. He's got the head turned to the side, so if they have to, they can pull things out off to the side. Keeping the airway open. Some things we want to do to try to make sure that the airway stays open once we get it in place. So uh, sometimes the e EMT can't keep it open. We're going to talk about calling advanced life support anytime you think you might need it. <clears throat> so know what your resources are. If you're in an ambulance with two EMTs or you're a volunteer firefighter and you're the only one on scene, do not be afraid to tap out and say, I need a more advanced care. That doesn't mean you stop until they get there and then take over for you. But anytime we think we might, we call for ALS. The other thing is to remember that it may be closest to go to the closest hospital. When we talk about taking a patient to the hospital, we typically say the most appropriate hospital. If the airway is not open, the most appropriate hospital is the hospital that has doctors. It doesn't have to be a level one trauma center. It doesn't even have to be a trauma center. A doctor that is in the hospital should know how to do advanced airway procedures. Most of the nurses do. So get them to the closest hospital. Some special considerations we need to pay attention to. If they have facial injuries, they may be bleeding into the airway and you may have to be suction on a frequent basis. So what we're going to do is kind of do like they do at the dentist office. Sec put the suction tube in the mouth and apply suction and just 10 seconds at a time and then stop, give a couple breaths and 10 more seconds. If they have an airway adjunct in, if they have one of our superglottic airways and you see something in the tube, you may have to use that French tip to s slide down in there and suck it out. Same with the endotracheal tubes. Do not go past the end of the tube. That is an advanced uh, maneuver, and that's uh, something that only the paramedics are allowed to do. So, But you can suction the tube itself. Uh, if they've got a solid obstruction, Suction devices will not get them out. So you're going to do abdominal thrust, chest thrust, finger sweeps, or call ALS, and they've got some more advanced measures where they can uh, use some uh, forceps to reach in there and pull something out. Dental appliances, it's preferred to leave the teeth in place. Uh, this was a real common problem in Missouri, trying to make sure they had the right teeth in the right places to do your uh, airway management. If it becomes a problem, take it out. Get it out of the way. And as always, if you have questions, write them down. Bring them to class. And we're going to talk about them. We're going to have fun with this chapter. So thank you and have a great day.